certainly nice to be back here in Sydney. It's uh, at least as nice as I remember it from the past. Uh, great to see everyone. And it's uh, certainly an honor to be invited to uh, speak here to the IGS workshop. This is, in my opinion, one of the, the best conferences around in this field. So that, that's quite nice. Uh, so yesterday we had a very nice uh, presentation on low-cost receivers for mass market applications and the, the exciting things that are coming up in that field. Uh, so they, today we'll mix that up and talk about expensive receivers that are not used for mass market applications. So these are, we are not uh, launching, uh, a, you know, smartphones into space just yet, but uh, you never know in a, in a decade or two. Uh, so these receivers are, uh, are you know, dual frequency high precision receivers that are mounted on spacecraft that are in low Earth orbit. They have at least two antennas, one or more looking upwards, and then one or more looking sidewards. And uh, the, the precise measurements that they provide are used to uh, back out information about the atmosphere that they travel through going from the GNSS transmitters down to the receiver on the LEOS uh, satellite. And together with uh, you know, a lot of fancy algorithms and careful processing, you can back out uh, a number of physical properties related to the atmosphere that those signals have traveled through. And the applications are, uh, are uh, you know, in, are really quite important. They, this, uh, this, these data sets are used in weather prediction. They're used in climate and space weather science. And I think uh, at some level everyone benefits because I, I think we can all agree that a good, uh, valuable uh, forecast, is, you know, that's accurate over a long time is, is very useful, especially when it comes to extreme weather events. Uh, so the title of the talk is GNSS Radio Occultation Science and Applications. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Rick Anthes, John Brown, Bill Quo, Bill Shiner, and Sergei Sokolovsky, all in the, in the Cosmic Group. So uh, an outline of the talk, I'll, I'll just spend one slide about the organization. It uh, is maybe not so familiar to all of the IGS. We'll take a brief survey of the radio occultation technique uh, at, a, at a fairly high level. We'll discuss some of the radio occultation missions that uh, are flying now and have flown in the past. We'll show some sample results about the uh, on the impacts of radio occultation data on weather prediction. So that's something that we can all relate to, I think. And then we'll get to some of the really fun stuff. Uh, a lot of the uh, we'll talk about the, the work going on in Cosmic Two, which is a new mission launching uh, in about a year. And to finish up, I'll talk about the, the, the very important interfaces that the RO community has with the IGS uh, products and services. All right, so uh, just a little bit about UCAR. It's the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. So as the name implies, they do research about the atmosphere. It's a consortium of uh, about 100 uh, North American universities. Uh, this consortium was founded in 1960 to uh, create and manage the National Center for Atmospheric Uh, it's a uh, fairly a reasonable size organization, 1,500 staff, about half, a little more than half of those are scientists. And engineers. The work they do is uh, more focused on science, uh, big computational and observational systems, big data sets related to the atmosphere, oceans, the sun, and so on. So a lot of, uh, of high-end processing going on. Uh, one of the buildings that's uh, kind of a landmark in the area is the Mesa Lab here. If you ever get there, there's a nice uh, ex exhibit area also a few hiking trails. Uh, they do fly, uh, they manage and fly a couple of airplanes. One is a C-130, it's a fairly large transport aircraft, and also this Gulfstream there. So of course it's now a goal of mine to, to fly that, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, the COSMIC program is, is a group within UCAR, it's about 25 staff, scientists, engineers, IT people, programmers, and support staff. And the expertise in the group spans a fairly wide range from uh, ground and space-based GNSS processing to radio occultation, of course, spacecraft integration and testing, and then on the, on the backside, the atmospheric space weather and climate science. All right, so, uh, so just a, a simple sentence about radio occultation. It's just a technique that looks at the bending of radio waves as they traverse an atmosphere. There are a lot of details there, and, uh, but it's not a very new technique. Uh, so it was used in the 1960s to look at planetary atmospheres uh, by some teams at JPL and Stanford uh, with the Mariner 4 mission. So uh, you know they looked at a couple of planets at the time. Closer to Earth, uh, this is a picture of the, the technique. So uh, we're going to take advantage of the GNSS transmitters. We have LEOs flying around the Earth with receivers that are looking, you know, as I mentioned, have these uh, forward and aft side looking antennas that are receiving the signals 
from the GNSS transmitters uh, as they go through the atmosphere. And when they do that, they, they bend, right? So if it were going through a vacuum, it would be a straight line, but it isn't a vacuum. So you have the bending of the signal, uh, some extra path delay and a bending angle. And from that, you can back out physical properties about the atmosphere. The, the key ones are uh, pressure and temperature, also information about humidity. Uh, and of course, you're also looking at the ionosphere, so that's uh, an, another area. OK, so uh, just a kind of a cartoon to, to illustrate this a little bit further. Uh, so, so this is a picture of Cosmic 2. I'll have some more details on that later. Uh, you can see here, so the POD antenna, there's actually two of them, and they're, they're sort of upward looking. They're not right on top, uh, as, as is typically done for POD. And the reason for that is that they want a picture of the ionosphere as well. So there's one that's tilted in one direction and one that's tilted in the other direction uh, for ionospheric sounding as well as uh, the POD. Then there's a phased array antenna. So this is a, a, fa a, a high gain, uh, an antenna that points high gain at the limb of the Earth. And then here you're looking at signals that are coming from the side. They're traveling through an atmosphere. Uh, and then this is the radio occultation processing. So the data types you, you get from these, uh, on the uh, POD antennas, it's, it's pretty much what we're used to in the geodetic community, pseudo range here. Wow, look at how they've weaponized the, uh, the atmosphere, the ionosphere. Yeah, look at this shit. Fucking lizards. I wonder if that's the sun simulator. Hmm. Yep. I wonder. Phase SMR, typically at a one hertz rate uh, on, on at least two frequencies. Now on, on the side here, this is done a little bit differently. This is still dual frequency data, but now we're tracking uh, in an open loop mode, which means we're, we're really uh, getting eyes and cues or phase and amplitude uh, measurements. And, and one key factor here is that those measurements still contain the navigation data message bits that are transmitted on the GNSS signal. So whenever that bit changes, the carrier phase flips by 180 degrees. And you have to undo that on the ground in the, in the ground processing uh, to do the occultation uh, retrievals. So you, you do need a ground network, uh, which is uh, illustrated there. For a couple of things, you have to have good orbits and clocks for the GNSS transmitters. So you, you do that with the ground network. Mm -hmm. You also need uh, fairly high rate clocks. I'll talk about that. Uh, in a bit. And you also uh, need the navigation bits uh, in, in a raw format. So we're used to Rhinex files that have decoded these, uh, but for this kind of processing, when you do the occultation uh, retrievals, you, you need to remove those bits um, on the ground. So uh, uh, just a few uh, lists here of characteristics of RO data. We'll just highlight a few. It will come as no surprise that you get global coverage. We're used to that in, in GNSS. You get profiles of the ionosphere, stratosphere, and troposphere. The, the temperature accuracy that you retrieve from these measurements is very good. It's on average about a tenth of a Kelvin uh, with a high precision that is listed there. So it's a, it's a really nice uh, thermometer, as, uh, as we'll mention in, in a couple of slides. Uh, you get pretty high resolution. So the occultation geometry right, will, can, start, can start high or low. But let's say it's, uh, it's a setting occultation. It might set, start high in the atmosphere. And then you track the occultation for a minute or two. And as the relative geometry changes, you go down into lower parts of the troposphere where the signal is traversing the atmosphere. Just like GNSS navigation, the technique. <laughs> okay, all weather minimally affected by aerosols? That means that they know about the chemtrailing. This motherfucker. Yeah, they all know about the fucking chemtrailing. Yeah. Works in weather, uh, and there are no significant effects from clouds or you know, rain or snow, those kinds of things. In terms of ionosphere, uh, typically you get absolute TEC uh, at the level of 1 to 3 TEC units. Relative TEC is a little bit better. There's no calibration that's needed. That's a, that's a very nice thing. Uh, we'll, we'll see later that some other atmospheric sounders uh, have biases, for example, and they actually use radio occultation data these days to calibrate some of those techniques. So that's that's very nice. It's also uh, becoming a climate benchmark. So there's a tie to SI standards. Uh, and the time series of radio occultation data from space is uh, getting to be about 20 years long now. And it's not continuous, but the first satellite doing this was GPS Met. And that started providing data in, 2000, uh, in 1996. 
So I mentioned already some of the scientific uses, but the, I think uh, one, of, one of the big ones is obviously weather. So all the major weather centers in the world now assimilate radio occultation data, and they use that in their forecasts. And uh, it's particularly useful in the southern hemisphere and over the oceans, which, which is not dissimilar to what we see with uh, geodetic data from the GNSS data, because uh, again, it's hard to put sensors uh, in the ocean and uh, in uh, remote areas. Ionosphere and space weather, it's a whole other area, and as I was just mentioning, climate. And uh, I think uh, a lot of these, the eminent scientists in this field agree that radio occultation does provide the best, uh, you know, accurate, precise, and, and stable thermometer in space. All right, so we'll talk about the RO processing uh, at a fairly high level, so I'll, I'll get into some of these in a, in a little bit more detail. But uh, as I mentioned, we start with the open loop data coming off the side looking antennas on, on these reels. So that's phase and amplitude. Next, uh, the next important step is that you have to calculate what's called an excess phase, and you can think of this as just the extra path delay. If the signal travels through a vacuum, it'll take a straight line because it's going through the atmosphere. It bends, there's a longer path length. So, so to get this, you have to know the location of the receiving and the transmitting phase centers. And of course, you want to know those as well as possible. So that's uh, near and dear to the, uh, a lot of the IGS community here. We're doing orbit determination both for the transmitters and the receivers. So the excess phase then goes into a bending angle uh, calculation. I'll have a slide on that. Um, and that, that's basically telling us the angle of, of the bending of the signal. From that, you, you do some more processing and you get to refractivity. That's uh, basically density of the air, and that relates to pressure, temperature, water vapor, and also the ionosphere. So uh, from, from that quantity, you can then go to, to the, the usual uh, things, the physical properties that, that people are, are uh, familiar with. So the, the bending angle, uh, just this is a geometric uh, optics representation, is, is this guy here. We have a straight line signal here. It gets bent, and then we have a receiver over here, and the bending angle is this quantity. Right there. So this technique is uh, useful in the upper troposphere and above. It's not uh, doesn't work that well as you go uh, further down. Uh, and in the last decade or so, wave optics based techniques have really taken over there. So, but we won't talk about them. They're, they're not nearly as nice to explain. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, to get to this, you do need precise knowledge of the transmitter and receiver locations. Now, what you, what you really uh, go through here is a little bit of math that relates the Doppler shift, which we measure with GNSS, to the bending angle in this picture here. And I won't go through that. But one, one interesting point uh, in, in this uh, RO community is that they worry a little bit more about velocity than they do the positions of the transmitters because they're dealing with Doppler shifts. Now, uh, you know, of course, you want to know both position and velocity. They're, they're related uh, as accurately as possible. But if you have some position errors in your orbits, and if they are approximately a bias over the course of an occultation, which might be a minute or two, uh, they actually don't matter that much because they're differencing data throughout that occultation. So that's, that's interesting. Um, but again, of course, you, know, you, you do want to do the best job you can. So the next step from, uh, from these bending angles is you do some processing involving an able inversion, and this gets fairly complicated. And you end up with refractivity, which is the quantity n over here. And as you can see, uh, refractivity now relates to pressure, ter pressure, temperature, water vapor, as well as the ionospheric contribution. So generally, you process dual frequency combinations to remove uh, at least the first order, the ionospheric effects. And then uh, you have this, this quantity. And the, you know, this is where now, you, now, of course, you want to work out, well, what are the contributions of the P and P? And uh, you know, that's where a topic that's familiar to a lot of people here comes in, you know, is that they're running filters. You know, either filters smoother or batch filters in, in these models to, to back out these, these particular contributions. I'm running out of um, time on here, so the I have to let you go. I'll put a link in this angle, in the description box. Uh, and then they do this internally. They go to refractivity, 